like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar Series. This is our 15th show tonight. And uh, if you've been uh, fortunate enough to watch all 15 shows, you should let us know in the chat page. I'm interested how many people have done that. And I would also let you know that if you've done that, that makes you an official aging expert by now. Uh, it doesn't, however, mean you can stop watching the show. You have to keep watching. Uh, we're really lucky tonight to have Joan Manick, uh, who's going to tell us a uh, pharmaceutical and biotech uh, perspective on aging. Uh, I want to remind you to use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions, and we will try to get to those. Uh, and before we start, I've asked one of my PhD students, uh, Shermaine Tien, uh, to tell us about a recent paper uh, in aging, and she's going to talk about lifelong restriction of dietary branch chain amino acids and their effect on the aging process. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Brian has mentioned, I'm his graduate student in the lab. And today I'll be presenting a paper um, published in Nature Aging, which was established uh, this year. So this study comes from Professor Dudley Lemming's group in, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so I think let's just get into the paper, which is about another kind of dietary intervention. I'll be talking today um, about protein restriction. So, um, in recent years, there have been several studies um, showing that uh, lower protein intake is associated with better health and longer lifespan. Um, but despite a lot of growing evidence in mice and in humans, um, one area of protein restriction actually still remains quite unclear. So the question being, which are the individual amino acids in protein restriction which actually mediate the beneficial effects you see? So this paper attempts to do just that. And what they want to do is address some of these questions looking specifically at a type of amino acid. Um, so namely branch chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. So um, high levels of branch chain amino acids have been linked to um, insulin resistance and obesity. And when you lower it, it seems to confer beneficial effects. Um, so today they'll be looking a little further into this, um, um, treating mice uh, on a BCAA restricted diet to look at how um, it improves lifespan and health span. So to, let me um, bring you through the key findings of this study. Uh, so firstly, they treated um, a progeroid mice, which is basically a mice that has the same genetic mutation as the human version which causes accelerated aging. So these mice, as you can imagine, they don't live very long. Um, but very interestingly, uh, when these mice were put on BCAA-restricted diets, uh, they actually lived much longer than their normal counterparts. And what they saw was quite startling. Um, they lived actually 125% longer. So moving on, what the authors wanted to next do is to look at how restricting the branch chain amino acids in the diet at middle age, how this influenced metabolism and frailty. Um, so just um, bringing you through the metabolic results, what happened was essentially they showed that 
when mice were exposed to this diet, they had lower fat mass. They were generally much leaner. Um, they had increased energy expenditure and they had also better blood glucose levels. Um, and as you know, just like humans, um, these mice, when they grow older, they tend to become frail and their movements become slower. Um, so what they found was that when these mice were put on this particular branched chain amino acid diet, what they find is that they have much lower frailty than their normal counterparts. So one very interesting thing is they also start to see very different sex-specific um, changes in males and females um, when exposed to this diet. So for instance, at middle age, um, females actually show much lower incidences of cancer when put on this diet. Um, although both genders actually re do reap the, re the benefits of um, improved metabolism and improved frailty. Um, so finally, they subjected these mice to lifelong exposure of these branched chain amino acids. And again, they started to notice um, different sex-specific um, changes. So only in the males, uh, they found that these males lived much longer when put on this branched chain amino acid diet. So in fact, um, the longest lived male in their cohort lived up to four years old, which is almost twice of what a normal laboratory mice actually lives um, um, in most of the experiments. So the interesting question they wanted to ask is why are these effects sex specific? So they looked at um, genes which were expressed in both male and female mice when they were fed these particular diets. And what was interesting was that um, the genes that were expressed in both genders were vastly different. And there were very few genes that were overlapping um, when male and female males were fed this diet. Um, also, it, another thing that was noteworthy is that in males, um, males had 80% more genes expressed in response to this diet than females, which may explain why um, only males uh, have extended lifespan on this diet in, as opposed to their female counterparts. So to summarize this paper, um, the results from this study actually show that when you restrict BCAA from your diet, it, it suggests that it might broadly promote metabolic health, such as glucose tolerance. Um, and it is also interesting to note that the diet has very sex-specific um, effects. When begun at the start of the life, it only benefits males and not females. Um, and if it's given at middle age, it actually promotes healthy aging in both males and females. So in a nutshell, this actually shows that in addition to just restricting protein as a whole, um, restricting branched chain amino acids might be actually an, a good alternative to promote healthy aging. So um, that's all from me today. I hope this actually gives you a little glimpse about restricting branched chain amino acids and protein restriction as a whole. Um, if you're interested in this study, uh, please check out the paper uh, on the website. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Brian. Thanks, Shermaine. You know, uh, regulating branched chain amino acids is uh, very critical, and there are a series of rare diseases, uh, including one called maple syrup urine disease, that result from defects and enzymes that uh, catabolize branched chain amino acids. And uh, that we've been uh, really interested in that disease. We have a mouse model we're studying and looking at therapeutic approaches in the lab, and that's uh, research that was supported by the. Uh, maple syrup urine disease family support group. So I should thank them and hopefully we can find something to help uh, these children that have these uh, these defects uh, in their enzymes. Uh, so I wanna turn back to aging uh, and introduce Joan Manick. Um, she's the head of R&D at Life Biosciences and she's gonna talk about the work she's starting there. She just uh, took this job recently. She started her career uh, in academic medicine at Harvard Medical School and more recently went to Novartis and then ResTorBio where she was involved in uh, some of the studies with TOR inhibitors and immune function. And we'll just touch upon that during the questions. But right now I'm like, excited to hear what you're doing at Life Biosciences, Joan. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Brian. I'm so happy to be able to participate. It's a great webinar series. 
So Life Biosciences is a company that was founded in 2017 to develop drugs that treat age-related diseases by targeting the biologic causes of aging. And I think a strength of this company and why I joined is they've in license the science of multiple world leading researchers who have developed interventions to halt and even reverse the biology of aging in animals. And the quality of the science is shown by two recent nature papers that came out of labs that we've in licensed the science. And then there's going to be a cell paper coming out in the next couple months. So really high quality science underlying their programs. The company is focused on three key platforms targeting aging biology. The first is an epigenetic reprogramming platform, the second a mitochondrial uncoupling platform, and the third a chaperone-mediated autophagy platform. And I'll explain the science behind each of these platforms and why they're important for aging. This platform approach is, allows us to have multiple shots on goal and develop treatments for multiple indications. So as people who have attended this webinar series probably know, people age 65 and older are the fastest growing population around the globe. This isn't just a first world problem, it's a global problem. And this means by the year 2050, the population who's over age 65 is going to far exceed the population who's under the age of five. And this means there's going to be a big demand for therapeutics that increase healthy longevity. And in fact, Bank of America expects this market to grow to 610 billion by the year of 2025. So why do we need therapies that increase healthy longevity? It's because healthy longevity isn't how people are currently aging. So currently people age 65 and above have a high burden of chronic illness. And as this population increases, this burden on healthcare systems is going to be crippling. So when you look at people under, under 40, only 5% of them have chronic diseases. The people between 40 and 64, about 20%. But 75% of people over 65 have chronic diseases currently. So why is this? Well, what's obvious, and but people don't really think about, is this just shows that aging is the biggest risk factor for most chronic diseases. And this graph is just another way of looking at it. We all inherently know we're not going to get most diseases until we get older. And this is just graph showing when diseases such as heart disease, Alzheimer's, cancer occur during life. And you can see they all start rapidly increasing incidence around the age of 60. So the question is, why does this happen? Why don't we get diseases when we're younger and we get them when we're older? And we used to just think this is just random wear and tear, our bodies fall apart and we get sick. But there's been groundbreaking research in the last couple of decades, including research by Brian Kennedy showing aging isn't just random wear and tear, it's actually a biology. And our biology shifts as we get older and this makes us permissive to getting all these different diseases. And what's really exciting is the science is showing us this, aid, this biolog biologic shift can actually be targeted with medications and reverted back to a younger state. And this means that aging is actually a modifiable risk factor. And this opens up whole new areas of medicine and potential treatments for the diseases on the right-hand side of the slide for which we don't currently have good therapies. So what is this biology that of aging, well, there are multiple discrete biologic mechanisms that have been shown to contribute to why we age. And this is just a diagram of these various mechanisms. And I'm gonna focus on three of them that are the focus of life biosciences. So as I mentioned, life biosciences is focused on three mechanisms underlying aging biology and targeting each of these mechanisms has been shown to extend health span and lifespan of preclinical species. So the first one on the bottom left is an epigenomic reprogramming platform. I'm gonna talk about what the epigenome is and as the next slide, but we're developing therapeutics to reprogram the epigenome to a more youthful state to restore cellular function. Then on the bottom right, we're also having a mitochondrial uncoupling 
program. This is developing therapies that improve how our bodies burn fuel, and this has implications for obesity, which is a major driver of aging. And the last is a chaperone-mediated autophagy program. We're developing therapies that help cells remove waste that accumulates as we age. So starting with the epigenetic reprogramming platform, the epigenome consists of chemical modifications of DNA and DNA binding proteins that regulate gene expression. And what happens as we age, and I'll show you this in the next slide, is these, these chemical modifications shift, and this dysregulates gene expression in cells. We've in-licensed a proprietary gene therapy that actually reprograms the epigenome back to a more youthful state by expression of three particular proteins called Yamanaka factors. The ability of the Yamanaka factors to reprogram the epigenome has been known for some time, but it was, has been unclear whether you could safely reprogram the epigenome with Yamanaka factors. And what is exciting about this gene therapy program is that mice who are given this gene therapy systemically, even after 16 months, have no adverse safety findings. So this is promising in terms of the safety profile of such a therapy. This program made the front cover of Nature a few months ago because it, uh, David Sinclair in his lab, this came out of the Sinclair lab, showed that intravitreal injection of OK OSK gene therapy in mice increased nerve regeneration after a nerve crush injury, restored vision in mice who had glaucoma, and significantly improved vision in naturally aged mice. So if we can restore vision in our older adult population, that would be a big medical advance. So just to some scientific background, as I mentioned, the epigenome consists of chemical modifications to DNA and DNA binding proteins. And these chemical modifications determine which genes are turned on and off and those genes encode proteins that cells use for cellular function. As we age, these chemical modifications start to shift. And this means that the wrong, <clears throat> wrong genes are turned on and off and this can cause cellular dysfunction. With this gene therapy, we reprogram these chemical modifications back to a younger state. And as I'll show you, this improves nerve function and regeneration. So one of the benefits, potential benefits of reprogramming the epigenome is that we may allow organ systems in adults to regenerate. And this is a capacity that's lost as we age. So in mammals, one of the first organ systems to lose regenerative potential during aging is the central nervous system. And for instance, retinal ganglion cells are cells in our retina that project axons back into the brain and these axons form the optic nerve. If you uh, um, harm the, those retinal ganglion cells or axons when animals are either in an embryonic state or a neonatal state, these axons can regenerate but this capacity to regenerate is lost within days of birth. So this is just the static adult nervous system. Those long, those sort of um, linear projections are the axons. If those are injured, they're not gonna regrow in an adult. But here is an embryonic nervous system showing these axons can regrow and regenerate. So the question is, can a Yamanaka factor can the Yamanaka factors reprogram the epigenome and allow an adult axon to regenerate like an embryonic axon? To look at this, David and his colleagues took mice that were adults, 52 weeks old, and gave them either on the top control gene therapy in their eyes or on the bottom OSK gene therapy, this gene therapy that expresses the Yamanaka factors. And then they crushed the optic nerves of the mice. And they looked five weeks later at whether these optic nerves could regrow. And as you can see with the controlled gene therapy, there was no regrowth of the optic nerve, but with the OSK gene therapy, even though these animals were adults, they were able to regrow their nerves. So this was exciting, but then the question is, are these nerves that are regrowing actually functional? Are they allowing vision to be restored? So to look at this, David and his colleagues looked at a mouse model of glaucoma. 
So glaucoma is a disease that is common in older adults, and it's caused by intra increased intraocular pressure in the eye, and this causes damage to the optic nerve. <clears throat> and when the optic nerve is damaged, this causes a loss of vision. Current therapies for glaucoma are just aimed at decreasing that intraocular pressure, but they don't restore vision. And in fact, the vision loss can persist even after therapies normalize the intraocular pressure. So a therapy that can actually stop the vision loss and restore vision would be a big medical advance. So David took a mouse model of glaucoma where the intraocular pressure is increased in the mouse and this is damaging the optic nerve and causing, causing visual loss and looked at whether OSK gene therapy versus control gene therapy could correct these vision problems. So he looked at the activity of the retina two different ways. One was by measuring the electrical activity in the eye when its lights are flashed at the eye and the other is measuring visual acuity. And you can see in gray, the mice, with, the mice with glaucoma have decreased electrical activity in the eye, but this electrical activity is restored in this dark blue line in the animals treated with OSK gene therapy. And this did not occur with control gene therapy. And then looking on the right-hand side of the slide in the gray bar, you can see visual acuity of normal control mice. And then in the orange bar, you can see there's a decrease in visual acuity in the mouse, mice with glaucoma. In the red bar is mice with glaucoma who've been treated for four weeks with the control gene therapy, no improvement in their vision. But in blue, the mice who have been treated for four weeks with the OSK gene therapy have partial restoration of their vision. And this is completely restored. This is at four weeks, at eight weeks, that vision is completely restored. So if this translates to humans, this would be a big improvement in the current standard of care for glaucoma patients. So moving to our second platform, it's a mitochondrial uncoupling platform. So mitochondrial uncouplers are known to increase metabolism, reduce free radical production, and extend lifespan in preclinical species. We have over 600 novel compounds synthesized with composition of matter IP granted, and we've demonstrated efficacy of these compounds in models of obesity and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. So how do mitochondrial uncouplers work? Well, in the bottom left of the slide, you can see normally in mitochondria, when we eat food, the nutrients are oxidized and they're used to generate a molecule called ATP, which is the fuel that cells need to survive and, and function. So the way this works is when nutrients are oxidized, they pump hydrogen ions from one part of the mitochondria, the mitochondria matrix, into another part of the mitochondria, the intermembrane space. As the hydrogen ions accumulate in the intermembrane space, they move back down their concentration gradient into the matrix. And as they move down the concentration gradient, this provides the energy needed to synthesize ATP. What the encouplers do is they, light, they allow these hydrogen ions to leak back into the matrix independent of ATP production. So this forces organisms to just burn more calories in order to generate the same amount of ATP. And this has obvious implications for obesity, which is important for aging. So obesity accelerates aging and the onset of aging-related diseases. And I just got this data about obesity in Singapore. About 1.7 million adults in Singapore are at risk of de developing obesity-related diseases. And the obesity is accelerating aging and accelerating the onset of multiple aging-related diseases, including brain disease, heart disease, liver disease, and musculoskeletal disease. So if we can increase the rate of metabolism and the rate that people burn calories, that may have benefits for reducing fat accumulation and diseases of obesity. And to look at this, and this was a paper published in last year in Nature Communications, we took one of our mitochondrial uncouplers called BAM15 and gave it to rodents who were on a high fat diet. So here you can see in green, the fat mass accumulation in rodents who are fed a normal diet. And here in red, the fat accumulation in rodents who are fed a high fat diet. 
This black line indicates when the rodents started eating BAM15, which is this mitochondrial uncoupler. And the rodents who got BAM15 are shown in blue. And you can see when they got this mitochondrial uncoupler, they lost fat mass, and then they didn't gain any fat mass, even though they stayed on a high fat diet. And in contrast, the animal control animals in red who stayed on the high fat diet kept gaining fat mass. What was important too is that the BAM15, although it decreased fat mass, had no effect on lean mass. So skeletal muscle mass and organ mass stayed the same. So we were these animals are losing fat, but not muscle, which would be important for humans. We then also looked at metabolic parameters in these animals, and not only did they lose fat mass, but they had better metabolic parameters. So the graph on the right or on the left is showing blood glucose levels after a glucose challenge. And you can see in red, mice who are on a high fat diet have high levels of glucose. The, in green, the rodents who are on a chow diet, just a normal diet, have lower glucose levels, and mice who are getting a high fat diet plus BAM15 have normalized glucose levels. Same thing with triglycerides, normal diet, triglycerides aren't elevated, high fat diet, they're elevated, but high fat diet plus a mitochondrial uncoupler, this normalizes triglyceride levels in serum. Similarly on the right side, in green with the chow diet, looking at triglycerides in liver, they are normal in a normal diet. They're elevated in animals getting a high fat diet and mitochondrial uncouplers normalize again this fat level in the liver. You can see this in the bottom figures. Fat in the liver is stained with, by, is red stained. And you can see chow diet, you don't see fat in the liver. High fat diet, you develop fat in the liver. And then BAM15, you decrease fat in the liver. Accumulation of fat in the liver is underlies why people get a disease called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is going to be a major problem and cause liver failure in our obese adult population. So developing drugs that decrease this fat in the liver is going to be important. And we're going to move our mitochondrial uncouplers ahead for this particular indication. So our last program is a chaperone-mediated autophagy program. Chaperone-mediated autophagy, or CMA, is a key mechanism by which cells remove unwanted and toxic proteins. This activity declines during aging in part due to reduced expression of a particular protein called LAMP2A, which plays a critical role in this process. We've identified novel compounds that increase the expression of this protein and thereby increase CMA activity. And we've shown these have benefit in multiple preclinical models. And I'll show you one of these in the next couple slides. So how does chaperone media autophagy work? Well, certain cells in our body have a particular amino acid motif and this is recognized by another set of protein in, in our body called HSC70. It's a, kind, it's a protein that's a chaperone. When HSC70 recognize proteins with the, this amino acid motif, they bring them to organelles in our body called lysosomes. The proteins that are targeted to the lysosomes enter the lysosome through a receptor called LAMP2A, and inside the lysosome, these proteins are degraded and they're recycled into nutrients for the cell. The activity of CMA is co controlled by the expression levels of this protein LAMP2A. And the problem, at, when we get older, this protein becomes unstable and levels of the protein go down. So you can see in three-month-old young mice versus 22-month-older mice, the older mice have lower levels of LAMP2A expression. And the same thing is seen in humans. In 25-year-old humans, there's nice high levels of LAMP2A, but these decline in 65-year-old humans. And because LAMP2A expression levels are going down, this means cells have less CMA activity, and therefore these proteins that should be degraded by CMA aren't degraded and they start accumulating in cells, and this causes cell toxicity and dysfunction. And this raises the question, if we can raise LAMP2 expressions back to a young level in older animals and in older humans, could this have health benefits? 
So Anna Maria Cuervo, who is a National Academy of Science member, a superb scientist who did all this work, looked at this first by genetically increasing LAMP2A expression in mice at the age of 12 months when LAMP2A expression starts declining. And she looked at these mice and said, are they healthier and do they live longer? So on the left is a movie of old mice, 26 month old, and one of them has overexpression of LAMP2A and the other is a control mice, mouse. The control mouse is this one that isn't moving and is starting to get bald. And the LAMP2A overexpressing mice is the one that has this nice shiny coat and is moving actively all around the cage. So what Anna Maria has found is that this boosting the LAMP2A expression keeps these animals much healthier longer. And this beautiful coat is different enough from the control mice that her, the work, people who are working in her vivarium can actually identify which are the LAMP2A ex overexpressors versus the control older mice just by looking at their coats. This LAMP2A overexpression also extended lifespan both of male and female mice, even though the LAMP2A overexpression didn't start till 12 months of age. So now we've developed compounds that increase just oral drugs that increase LAMP2A expression the same way as it's genetically increased in these mice. And I'm just gonna show you some benefits of this LAMP2A overexpression in one model system. This was a paper published in Nature a couple of months ago showing that CMA activation with one of our compounds that increases LAMP2A expression restores the function of aged stem cells. So hematopoietic stem cells are the stem cells in our body that generate other blood cells, platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. And the ability of these hematopoietic stem cells to generate new blood cells declines as we age. One of the reasons the activity of these stem cells may be declining is because LAMP2A expression, as it happens in many cells, declines over time in this cell population. So here's LAMP2A expression in, four, in stem cells from four-month-old mice, and here's in blue LAMP2 expression in stem cells from 30 month old old mice. This decrease in LAMP2A expression is associated with a decrease in CMA activity. CMA activity is normal at four and 12 months old, but declines in the 30 month old mice. Anna Maria treated these old mice with a, one of our CMA activator compounds and then looked on the right at the ability of these the stem cells in these old mice to generate new blood cells. And you can see the stem cells of the mice treated with the CMA activator compound in red is much better ability to generate new blood cells than the control stem cells from old mice. So this is, opens up therapeutic areas where we may be able to rejuvenate the function of stem cells in older adults. And this has a variety of therapeutic indications um, that are opened up by this therapy. So in summary, Life Biosciences is addressing one of the greatest global health challenges and we're excited to be in this area along with some multiple other companies. This is really important area for biotech companies to be in because older adults age 65 and older are the fastest growing population across the globe and they're currently burdened with multiple chronic diseases. And because we now know that aging is the biggest risk factor for almost every chronic disease and it's a modifiable risk factor, this opens up whole new areas of medicine. Groundbreaking research over the past decade has revealed that aging is this modifiable risk factor that can be targeted therapeutically as a new way to treat these aging related diseases. And this is estimated to be going to be a very big market because it's such an unmet need. Life has a diversified portfolio targeting this aging biology. We have three platforms, epigenetic reprogramming, mitochondrial uncoupling, and chaperone-mediated autophagy. And each platform has the potential to prevent, treat, or reverse multiple aging-related diseases. And that's it, and thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Joan. Um... That's a great talk, and it gives us a lot of different things to, to discuss. And I, I thought that uh, uh, I won't, before we, at some point, I want to get a, just a minute on Restore Bio, but let's talk about life biosciences first because it's uh, uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff there. And the thing that jumps out at me whenever I hear about these therapies is that 
you know, it's how do you pick an indication for targeting these aging pathways? Because I know that was true with TOR, but also with all three of these approaches, you could imagine them working for all kinds of different chronic conditions of aging. And, and uh, um, you know, it's almost like uh, there's too many options to choose from. So, I mean, how do you go about that from a pharmaceutical perspective or biotech perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. I think one of the key factors is whether an animal model will predict what happens in a human. So we try to pick indications where the animal model is predictive of the human efficacy. And we try to pick indications where there's a, an ability to see a beneficial effect in a relatively short proof of concept trial so that we can make a early go, no go decision before spending millions and millions of dollars on huge long trials. So there's sort of some pragmatic thinking that is involved so that you have maximize your chance of success when you get to the clinic. So this is still sort of in a way, it's a it's novel pathways and targets, but still kind of a classical approach of targeting disease indications. Does the company imagine going after aging directly at some point? Well, you know, this is a, it's a really interesting question. So when you target aging itself, it's going to, you have to just pick some endpoint to show that the risk of your drug is outweighed by the benefit. And there are so many aging related conditions that may benefit and you just need to pick one and show that you have a benefit in that one in order to have a drug approved. It may turn out that that drug over time has benefits in more than one aging related condition, in which case we may be able to get a more broader scope kind of anti-aging indication by grouping these different aging problems together. But as a start, I think we, again, just for pragmatic reasons, it's important to just pick one and show that you have the benefit is outweighing the risk. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a dichotomy from like people that are taking lifestyle approaches and, and supplements where there are a lot of those companies are trying to target aging directly. And that comes with its challenges as well. And, and the, the you know, drug approach, uh, which is more based on, uh, you know, having to get things approved by the FDA and reimbursed. Right. So it's still a, it's still a, both, both paths are challenging, but it's nice to see that, that companies are going down both now. I mean, yes. You know, pharma still hasn't quite jumped on board. Do you think they will in the near future? Big pharma. Oh, yeah. I think, I think we're like on a tsunami that just is going to hit. And I think they're waiting. Um, my guess it's going to be like the next gene therapy wave. The aging biology and the potential of targeting this biology has such profound implications on the practice of medicine that... I think they're waiting for the first program to sort of succeed through a pivotal trial. And then I think there's going to be a lot of people jumping on board. So, I mean, how far away, it, it sounds uh, like things are still relatively early stage for these three programs. How far from the clinic are you? Yeah, we should have our first pro program in the clinic in 2022. So we're not far. And you, can you say which one that is, or is that too? I don't know that that has been disclosed yet. Um, so I probably can't say, at, um, but that one of the three is, is going to be in the pro in the clinic in 2022. We can, we can do a test, you know, I can mention all three and we can see which time you blink. So <laughs> I'm joking. I won't do that. Yeah. Let's talk about the epigenetic re reprogramming. You know, it's really interesting because you know, it was like almost 30 years ago that David Sinclair and I were at a, in Lenny Garenti's lab at MIT working on epigenetic reprogramming and aging and, 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 and yeast cells. And so it's nice to see that that's made its way all the way to humans, hopefully in the near future. So, uh, but, um, you know, when people talk about using the Yamanaka factors, everybody worries about uh, cancer. Uh, and uh, of course, you're only using three of those four factors and not MYC. And, uh, you know, it sounds like there's there, at least in the preclinical models, there hasn't been a, a problem with that in, in the cell types that are being tested. Do you foresee, you know, can, car carcinogenesis as is an issue here or is keeping MYC out of it the secret? What's the story? 
So I think keeping Mick out of it is very important because Mick is known to promote tumor growth. But I think we have to, this is another one where we have to be very careful and make sure we treat for the shortest period of time in limited areas like the eye and not systemically because we really want to make sure that we limit any potential cancer risk by shortening. It's known that the longer you express Yamanaka factors and the more diffuse in, you express it in all different tissues, the greater the risk of cancer. And so by really limiting the duration and the location of the Yamanaka factors, I think there's a path forward that's really exciting to sort of rejuvenate the epigenome and have kind of remarkable benefits on cell function. Can you and say we just have to be smart. Is this like a gene therapy approach or they're sort yes. of if you're take so you're directly taking that approach? Right. And a doxycycline inducible therapy mm -hmm. so that you can turn the expression on and off. Yeah, no, that's exciting. So, you know, you can, uh, that's a clear case where you could imagine benefits in a whole range of tissues, but it seems like you've chosen ones that are not very proliferative and that are, uh, can be controlled regionally. So Exactly. Local delivery, non-proliferative tissues, and that maximizes safety. Yeah, that's exciting. You know, on mitochondrial and couplers, you know, people get confused about that because they they think about it, it's almost like a waste of calories, right? You're, you're adding these uncoupling factors and they're taking calories and just going through these futile cycles and, and, and making less ATP. Is that, the, is that the benefit here? Is this just a proxy for uh, eating less food? No, so you get to eat the same amount and burn <laughs> it up, which is like, so there's a, a potential for abuse for this. But what's interesting about the compounds that life has generated is they're self-limited. So as you start um, uncoupling, they lose activity. And so you'll never uncouple enough to stop making ATP and have a lot of toxicity. So it's just mild uncoupling enough that cells just keep on having to burn more fuel, but still can make the same amount of ATP. And the other interesting thing is when you uncouple, electrons move more efficiently through the electron transport chain. And so you get less free radical formation. And so there's an oxidative stress benefit of these compounds too. That's what so I was going to really ask. How does, it, how does it alter rates of oxidative stress? So it, 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 it reduces it. it. It reduces it because less electrons are available to form superoxide, react with oxygen. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the other small molecules that have been linked to aging, including metformin, are complex one inhibitors. And so they are also affecting uh, electron transport chain, but um, you know, in a different way than directly activating uncouplers are. So um, you know, it may be that directly activating uncouplers has less uh, unwanted problems. And it, I think it's important to note that in your, you know, the, the studies you showed that the animals on a normal diet were not uh, experiencing weight loss or any particular problems with-, with uh, right small molecules. So that suggests that it, and, and that's actually true of metformin too, for people with normal glucose levels, it doesn't seem to um, push levels down too low. So, um, so that's a, that's a screening program. So that, so it was just a, a screen for activation of uncoupling proteins. Is that the, that's how the molecules came? They actually look at oxygen consumption rate oh, screening and mm -hmm. so they increase oxygen consumption and metabolism, and they pick the compounds that do that. I see. I see. And a lot of them target uncouplers. So, right. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I want to have a show. I'm going to actually have Anna Maria Cuervo on a future show. She doesn't know that yet. So if she's <laughs> listening, I would recommend not answering the telephone. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I want her to talk about autophagy in general, and particularly chaperone mediated, auto mediated autophagy, because she's, really been a you know the one of the people driving that 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 forward and it's a bit different than uh, sort of macro autophagy so do you want to tell us a little bit more about you know what does chaperone mediated autophagy target what kinds of proteins or damaged yeah. proteins does it clear so it's fascinating it's not macro autophagy can um, chew up protein aggregates, missed dysfunctional organelles, sort of complex um, 
structures in cells. Sh chaperone media autophagy only targets individual proteins and it's not damaged proteins, it's proteins that have this particular amino acid sequence, which 70% of the proteome has. So it's a way of just regulating and recycling proteins in the body. And what she's showing is that when this declines with age, there's a large body of proteins that are in a soluble state that start shifting to an insoluble state. And this of course has implications for multiple diseases associated with protein aggregation, but it's very different than macroautophagy because it's specific. It's just targeting specific soluble proteins for degradation. So, so it's targeting like you know the precursors for aggregation rather than exactly. the aggregates themselves. So exactly, it's catching, earlier. Catching the problem before it becomes more that severe. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean that's a really interesting area of, of work. It's really been heard a lot of lo large part her studies that have, have shown the importance of that for aging. That mouse experiment I think was surprising to a lot of people because they were thinking more about macroautophagy, and of course macroautophagy could be linked to aging too. But um, you know, one of the challenges with autophagy is you don't want to have it on constitutively, at least macroautophagy, and you know that's a problem for muscle and other things. So. This might be a more targeted intervention that uh, uh, gives you the benefit without worrying about overdoing it. Exactly. Um, uh, we'll come to uh, Shoping in a sec. Just quickly, uh, a lot of people ask me about the uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, augmentation studies with uh, TOR inhibitors at Restor Bio, and I know you were central in many of those studies. And and can you just summarize sort of the the, the good parts of the, the phase two and what happened in the phase three in just a minute or two and why, why you think that these happened also? Yeah, so there's two separate things that we've shown that mTOR inhibitors do that have benefit for the aging immune system. One is if you pre-treat people with an mTOR inhibitor and then give them a flu vaccination, they have a better response to the flu vaccination. And it looks like some of that benefit is due to the fact that mTOR inhibitors decrease exhausted T cell numbers in humans. A second thing we found when we were doing the vaccination studies is that people who were getting the mTOR inhibitors were reporting having fewer respiratory tract infections of all kinds. And so that had nothing to do with the vaccination. They were just reporting having fewer infections. So that gave us a sense, wait, mTOR inhibitors must be having more benefit than just enhancing a vaccine response. They seem to be enhancing their antiviral response because most respiratory tract infections are caused by viruses. So we did phase two studies showing that when people, older adults given mTOR inhibitors during winter cold and flu season had fewer respiratory tract infections and fewer severe respiratory tract infections. And these were laboratory confirmed infections where you had to meet specific diagnostic criteria and have a nasopharyngeal swab where a virus was detected. In our phase three trial, the FDA said, for a phase three trial, laboratory confirmation isn't important to people. This was before COVID-19. People only care about their symptoms. So you just have to show that you can reduce respiratory symptoms of any cause, whether they're laboratory due to a laboratory confirmed infection or not. That, that's hugely subjective though, right? That was the problem. So, and, and they said, we want older adults to fill out a diary every day of every respiratory symptom they've had. <laughs> and in our previous trials, we had just called them twice a week. Yeah. So it turns out older adults have a lot of respiratory symptoms that they were, if you ask, did you have a runny nose? Did you have a cough? Did you sneeze? Did you have a headache? Do you have muscle? Light? You know, there's a lot of symptoms and it's really hard to distinguish which are respiratory tract infection versus, you know, they have a little asthma, they live with heart failure, they have a little arthritis, what is going on? And so it became a very messy endpoint. So I think that was part of the reason we didn't hit our phase three endpoint. But in addition, it's looking like these mTOR inhibitors have more of an effect on severity than on incidence of disease. So I think the drugs may work and actually may work for COVID for decreasing severity more than just do you get an infection or not. 
maybe that isn't the right endpoint. It's are you getting infection with severe symptoms? Should Which be is, the endpoint in trials going forward. Which is really the important point, right? Especially in older people. So. Right, right. So I think it's just a matter of a learning curve and getting the endpoints correct. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to get an update on that because I get thousands of questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> Xiaoping, uh, what is what's the audience asking? Hello, Brian. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Manning, we are delighted to have you with us today. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. And uh, that was really, really exciting. We, we do have a wide variety of uh, questions from the floor. Uh, maybe we start with this question from uh, David Fan, who asked, out of the three hallmarks of aging that life bioscience have chosen to target, which one do you think offer the best promise of success? Honestly, it's like my children. I love them equally. They are really, really exciting. I do not have a favorite. I think they all, they all can treat so many different diseases. I think each of them is going to hit. You know, we may not always get the right hit, but I think we have a lot of options for each of them, and each of them are going to make a big difference. Oh, so it, it's, it's possible that if all of them work, we can even combine all of them together and achieve a greater effect, do you think? Yeah, but you could. And I also think each of them can treat many different things and figuring out which, which um, disease area each one has the best efficacy is something we're just going to have to figure out. But they're both also fundamental, and there's so much data for all of them about uh, the potential for improving aging-related diseases that I think each of them has a really good chance of success and is going to make a difference. Wow, that's great. So um, we are also uh, indeed very surprised that the in-situ reprogramming is uh, feasible with those three factors. Uh, some of the audience asked, which epigenetic uh, modification does the OSK affect? Does it have any effect on the histone mark as well? Yeah, this is all in the Nate David's Nature paper. And it, it if you look at multiple epigenetic marks, they all shift to a younger state. And I can't tell you exactly what all the modifications he looked at are, but they should, I, you know, can forward the nature paper to whoever in the audience um, mm. would like to look at, look it up. Okay. No, no issue. So uh, mm -hmm. while we are on the topic of uh, epigenetic reprogramming, Prof. Uh, Barry Hedrivel has uh, asked, uh, would this also work for macular degeneration? Yeah, it's a great question, and we're actually looking at that right now. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Barry Harrell also asked uh, about the mit mitochondrial uncoupling, that he hoped that this compound, the BAM15, right, are uh, mm -hmm. more safer than dinitrophenol. And yeah. uh, how about the heat generation, since we are doing uh, mitochondrial uncoupling? Yeah, it's a great question. So DMP was a compound that was used in the 30s. It was a mitochondrial uncoupler to, for weight loss. And it was quite effective at weight loss, but it wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem was it uncoupled membranes besides mitochondrial membranes and it caused toxicity. And it also wasn't limited. So you could uncouple mitochondria all the way to no ATP production. The, the compounds that life has generated are one, specifically only uncouple the mitochondria. They don't uncouple other plas like plasma membranes, so they are much safer. And two, they're self-limited. So they only work in a relatively a high pH environment in the mitochondrial matrix. And oh. as that pH starts lowering, they don't work anymore. So they'll only partially uncouple mitochondria and then they lose activity. And because they're pH dependent, they won't work in other parts of the cell and therefore won't uncouple other membranes. Wow, gosh, this BAM15 seem really, really promising. <laughs> yes, yep. Yeah. So uh, may I follow up with another question from uh, Stephen? Mm -hmm. He asked, uh, it has been well established that in the literature that uh, increasing autophagy 
improve lifespan and health span in multiple species. Is there an advantage to uh, focus on CMA instead of uh, the other type of autophagy or other form of uh, autophagy? Like, is it specifically targeting CMA more effective to improve lifespan and health span compared with the other type of uh, general autophagy? Yeah, I think one of the advantages, I think targeting macrotophagy, there's multiple good targets for aging. And targeting macroautophagy, there's a lot of rationale for doing that, and that should be done. Nobody has been really thinking about targeting chaperone mediatophagy, and one of its benefits is you only target the soluble proteins that have a particular motif, and they have to be recognized by a chaperone. So upregulating this process isn't going to sort of chew up the cell and chew up every, you know, have have problems because it's a it's kind of tightly regulated. So by just upregulating these lamp two A expression and allowing this to occur more efficiently, it's a safe way of improving proteostasis that won't can't be easily overdone. So there's safety benefits to this particular target. Okay, so well, we have a lot of questions coming up. Let's go back to uh, the mitochondria. We're, we're entering the speed round, Shoping. So, okay, uh, so uh, one uh, short question. Does mitochondria uncoupler band fitting contribute to induction of uh, UCP1 or, or generation of beach uh, adipose tissue and promote browning of white adipose tissue since it doesn't, it reduces fat, right? And, wait, uh, no, it doesn't cause browning of adipose tissue and um, it doesn't have, it's, it functions like a uncoupling protein, but it's not, it doesn't have an effect on the uncouplers. It just sort of mimics their activity. Oh. So it's like you're, you're putting a fake mitochondrial uncoupler into cells that's doing the same job. Okay, okay. So um, last question. There seems to be a very excited audience they're asking when can they start purchasing it over the counter? <laughs> when can when can white go over the counter? When, they when are you going to sell the all these factors over the counter, Joan? <laughs> well, I think we'll, they're probably going to be prescription <laughs> rugs, but we are trying going as fast as we can to move these into the clinic and prove you know that that their efficacy is. Um, better it outweighs their safe any safety risks, and we really, you know, there's such an unmet need. As Brian knows, I'm a physician. You know, I've had aging parents and seeing how they struggled. So just bringing these forward and improving how we age is is such a motivating factor for me. So, um, just one last quick question. So. You know, we've both been thinking about this for a long time. You know, how close are we? Are, are we solving this aging problem or is it uh, it's still a long way away? Oh, no. I, I mean, I think people are really making mistake to think it's a long way away. It's close. There, we are, there's so many untapped great biologic mechanisms that, you know, in our little sphere of aging researchers we understand. And I think as more and more biotech and pharma companies understand all of these targets that haven't been tapped and the potential health benefits that will come from tapping this biology, you know, I think we're going to start going faster and faster and faster in moving this forward. Yeah, uh, That's how I feel too. So I, 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 I think it's it's nice to see the field really take off to this level and, and all the private sector involvement and the human studies going. It's been a long time trying to get that to happen. So it's, it's you know people like you've been driving that. So thanks for the talk and everything you're doing to really push the aging field forward. Um, so I want to remind you to use the panelists and all attendees button if you want to participate in chat afterwards. Uh, please register for the next webinar. Our speaker will be Morten uh, Scheibe Knudsen from the University of Copenhagen, and he'll be talking about interventions in aging. Uh, so he's doing a lot of exciting things, and I'm sure he'll have a lot to tell us. Um, so before I close, we, you know, Joan's in Boston, and I thought we would end with a little 
piece that was from a TEDx uh, in Boston, and it's from a Harvard study looking at what makes a good life, uh, a, a very long-term study on what uh, is important for happiness in, in older individuals. You know, I thought the answer was Hongjiao and Baipotaljiao. Uh, and by the way, if you don't know Mandarin as well as I do, that's your problem. Uh, it turns out, though, that the answer is something quite different. So watch and find out. And thanks for joining the show. Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame, or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well-connected. Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. 